Hey you guys, welcome to book review number 60. So we can get this. 64. Uh, Reinventing Japan by Ian Burma. I don't know if you guys can see that. Maybe not. Yeah, there you go. Um, so anyway, what this book is about is it's a history book about uh, Japan from 1853 or when the Meiji Restoration happened to 1964 when uh, the United States uh, sent the last of their troops, or actually there are still troops in Japan, but when the last of the occupation happened, and from that point forward, uh, Japan had United States soldiers on its soil uh, as per its own directive, not per directive of the United States. But anyway, like I said, it starts with the Meiji Restoration. Um, Oh, excuse me, with the uh, black ships came right before the Meiji Restoration. So what happened is, Japan had been an isolationist kind of feudal kingdom uh, prior to 1853. But at this point, it was sort of like at the height or the apex of the Age of Discovery. And Japan uh, essentially was forced to open its ports for trade from other countries. Now, being an isolationist kingdom, this was very uh, difficult for them. Um... And the key event that really uh, spurred this on was, I believe his name was Matthew Perry, sent a bunch of ships to Edo uh, Harbor, I believe, um, which is modern day Tokyo, or it was somewhere along the you know main part of the Japanese coast, and essentially demanded to see the emperor, and which no one in Japan had access to because the emperor was like you know, on another plane, uh, and then also, uh, to open up its cities for trade, which Japan was against. So, obviously, this led to, uh, conflict w between the warlords. Now, what happened at this point, or what was going on at this point in Japan was, uh, the warlords were fighting one another, and the emperor just had sort of, like, titular rule. He wasn't really, had any power within the country. But to unify the country, see, the country was sort of ununified at this point. Uh, it was still, I think, what you would call one nation state, but kind of like various sub kingdoms within their uh, nation state, largely being autonomous and uh, fighting one another and kind of skirmishing. And so, what eventually happened is one of the groups that was looking to gain power for themselves said that the emperor should be put back on the throne and with this uh pretext or not put back on the throne but should be uh given power again and sort of they use that as a pretext to push their own political agenda and so what happened is is uh the emperor came back into power now the japanese still had an isolationist feeling uh after they had unified as a country see it was very important to unify in order to uh present a strong um, singular uh, fist, I guess you'd say, <laughs> to foreign traders and not really even so much colonizers because most of the foreigners weren't really looking to colonize, but Japanese, Japan was isolationist enough that they didn't even want to trade, which uh, foreigners like the Dutch and the English and Americans clearly wanted to do. So, what the Japanese decided to do after unifying the country was to modernize and now uh, this seems sort of ironic considering they were an isolationist not really backwater but kind of um not modern kingdom i guess you'd say they still used very basic pistols when or kind of muskets when a lot of other countries uh were moving to more like rifles stuff like that they also didn't have a naval fleet at all uh up until the meiji restoration so uh, that was sort of the first stage in modernization um, without democracy. And over time, what this eventually led to was World War II. I'll get into that in a little bit. Now, one of the things that happened between when the Meiji Restoration and uh, World War II occurred was groups fought politically, which you would think would not be the case under say a totalitarian um uh emperor rule but actually that only really started 
in the late 1930s where dissent was completely or political opposition was completely snuffed out. But what happened was, and this has more to do to say with like the culture of Japan, was countries, um, countries, political factions uh, argued over points, but they were points that were sort of like false, um, not false equivalents, but uh, so they, oh, there's a specific word for this. Um, false ends, I don't know. It's where the sides argued over a point, but kind of sort of their end point was very similar. So, for example, uh, one side, which was the, uh, well, I forget the name of these political factions, I'm really kind of rambling here, but one of the, one of the political factions argued that the emperor should still have some power, but the primary military directive should be done by the military. And the other side said that, uh, no, the emperor should have direct power over the military and he should be the one to really choose. But the problem with this is that the end goal for both of them was sort of an imperial, militaristic, um, colonial outlook type of society. Uh, there was no debate about whether they were going to take uh, Korea as a colony. It was more, merely um, what were the means to that ends, and the ends was always the same. Or at least in terms of the, the destructive element of it, it was almost always the same. Um, and the reason I say that this is part of Japanese society is uh, Japan is a society that focuses very much on process, but doesn't always focus on end goals. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the, the cultural side of it, but for example, like the way that you interact with another human being is very much ritual based. Um, now, not it's not always like wearing kimonos and traditional dress, but even in modern Japan, um, there's a particular protocol that you have to deal with when dealing with like businessmen and stuff. And so like uh, the, the sort of process or protocol of these people debating when eventually coming to the same point of Japan is a glorious nation and its people are superior uh, was unquestioned. Um, not to say that the Japanese aren't good people, but you know there was no dissent on uh, some of these end goals. Okay, so after the Meiji era, I believe it was the the Taisho era, I want to say. Um, I am not 100% on this. Uh, let me look this up real fast. Because they do have chapters in here. Uh, I thought they did. Um, I think it was the Taisho era. And essentially, yeah, here we go. Um... <laughs> And essentially what happened during that era, it doesn't say here, is that uh, it was kind of like the Weimar Republic in uh, Germany in that um, there was a lot of encouragement of the arts. There was a lot of encouragement of kind of um, progressive personal culture. Uh, people wore Western dress. People, um, you know, stayed out all night drinking. Uh, people um, were very open, but there wasn't that sort of solid democracy behind it. It was kind of a um, cultural opening. This also coincided, it's similar to the Weimar Republic, but the, in, the Weimar Republic was in fact a democracy, a very feeble democracy. It was that the emperor, I think Taisho, at this time uh, was uh, very kind of inept and he didn't exert a lot of power so the military stepped in but the military at this point was not ready to truly be the force that it was in world war ii so there was kind of a um slacking from both the military side which wasn't fully developed yet and the the emperor imperial side of the most conservative elements of the society um now this isn't to say that uh strong liberal democratic society stepped in its place but just merely that there maybe wasn't the crackdown or the punishment uh during this time period um it's also during this time period that i believe um 
Japan had its first major military victory against a Western power, and really its first military victory in the post Meiji Restoration era. And that was the 1895 uh, victory against the 1895 against uh, Tsarist uh, Russia, against the Russian monarchy. Um, and the basic reason why Japan was able to do it was the majority of Russia is uh, on the far, far side of the world, or, you know, extremely far away. And to get any ships to the Pacific, they actually had to go all the way around uh, uh, the Cape of Africa, all the way around Singapore, and then up to uh, um, Japan and, uh, you know, that part of the Pacific. Well, what had happened by this point is Japan had pretty much achieved all their objectives. They had sacked Vladivostok. They had retaken Port Arthur, which is now known as uh, uh, Dali, I want to say, uh, on the southern shores of Manchuria on the Yellow Sea. Um, they had defanged any attempt by Russia in uh, Korea. And really, most importantly, is that they had taken over key railroad lines in Manchuria between Port Arthur and uh, Russian Siberia. This is important because later uh, Japan would invade Manchuria, but it was under the pretext of protecting these railroad lines, which were not uh, Japanese territory, but which were militarily uh, occupied and monitored by Japan. Uh, Oh, and I guess the other spoil of that war was that half of the Surkran Islands were given to Japan. The, I want to say, Ryu Islands up north of Japan and also Taiwan were all... Um, no, Taiwan was given later. Uh, but that, that kind of uh, area, a few islands in the north were given to Japan. Uh, and it also sort of led the pretext for... Um, the Chinese, Chinese, the Sino-Japanese War, which happened in 1905, ten years later, which very nationalistic, but neither side was particularly China, was really developed in any way. So it was almost like your sort of old school warfare of a lot of cavalry, a lot of uh, you know just running at one another, even though you had you know dangerous weapons and guns and stuff. It wasn't really the crushing modern military that you would see some 40 years later. Um, the side effect of this was that Taiwan was immediately given to Japan and uh, Korea was, uh, I think, given protectorate status, but then five years later in 1910 was just taken as a colony outright. So Japan is expanding. Um, even as its feeble emperor uh, sits on the throne and its military is not up to take on a true Western power like the Great Britain or the United States or anything like that. And also, probably under certain circumstances, Japan couldn't take on Russia. It was just under the particular circumstance of the 19, or 1895 war that uh, Japan won. So... Then there was a time period of militaristic buildup. Now, um, this was also a time period after the uh, ta Taiji Taishi Emperor died. Oh, I'm gonna have to get going on here. Uh, his successor, which I think was Horhito, maybe, <laughs> um, became much more conservative, um, much more militaristic. And really, when you have a society that doesn't have democratic controls, but you have a bunch of people that are thinking progressively, they really have very little power to stop a uh, the people that do have control, the government or whatever. So, uh, what eventually happened was World War II. Um, now, when World War II started is a bit of a debate. Was it when... Uh, Japan invaded Manchuria in 1932. Was it when... I think it was 1932. Or maybe it was like the late 1920s. Uh, yeah. 
was it when Japan uh, invaded across the bridge, whose name I'm forgetting, uh, near Beijing in 1936? Or was it when Japan, I think it was 36 or 38, these dates aren't good. Uh, and then, or was it December 4th, 1941, which was the day that lived, was it the day that lived in them for me? When the United, or when uh, Japan uh, sacked the United States port at Pearl Harbor with a uh, giant bombing campaign. Now, one of the things that I found interesting, this is once again shows Japanese culture. The United States had cut off oil supply to the, particular trade, to the Japanese nation, and they had very little oil reserve. Um, to keep up its military machine in China, which remember by 1941 they had already been invaded, and actually the raping of Nanking, which I'll kind of swing around to in a second, had already happened. Um, but... In order to keep that up, they needed the United States assistance. So really, Japan had two choices. They could either slowly withdraw from China, which most people saw, uh, or most uh, kind of the true military experts within the Japanese army saw as a possible win, but a long-term win, sort of like a quagmire. Like They certainly didn't believe they could lose, but they knew that like it wasn't going to be easy. Um, so they could withdraw from that and then conserve their oil, or they could keep going and uh, <laughs> have the Japanese uh, Navy try to, A, invade countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, for oil reserves, and B, attack the United States in order to try to bully them into giving them more favorable trade status with their oil. Now, the first option is not going to happen because Japanese the Japanese military at this time would never say, oh, we can't win this. It's always, oh, we have this. This this is easy. We can do this. But also the Japanese Navy knew. See, the Army knows that they're stuck sort of in a semi-quagmire in China. And the Navy knows that they can't really long-term sustain a war against, one another, against the United States uh, with their battleships. But because neither side wants to lose face it, if you will, they both uh, uh, say this is all possible. And so even the Navy knew before that they were going to do the bombing that this really wasn't going to work in the United States, but because of the protocol, if you will, they were uh, required to do it as part of their thing. Which brings up another interesting point that they brought up in the book. Unlike in um, uh, Germany, where Hitler really was both the nominal leader of the country, had totalitarian control, um, there were no rivals, or if there were rivals, they would have gone very, very quickly. In Japan, um, there was an agreement on what Japan should, the, the superiority of the Japanese people and what the expanding empire of Japan should look like. But who was exactly running the show was a bit of a mystery. Was it Horihoto? Was it Tojo? Was it um, the head of the army whose name I'm forgetting? Uh, all these people wouldn't admit to one another what, be honest with one another, what their true circumstance was. So needless to say, uh, Japan eventually got overwhelmed both with being stuck in China and just not having enough manpower and resources to take on. Uh, the revved up machine that was the United States of America. And it led to its downfall. So what happened is in 1945, the armaments was signed. The <clears throat> MacArthur came in. Uh, Horhoto was allowed to stay in power because he was the emperor and it was their cultural tradition, which a lot of people were kind of upset about, particularly, uh, obviously, the Koreans, the Chinese, Rape of Nanking. I think they mentioned uh, um, something like 200,000 people died in the Rape of Nanking. And uh, unlike in other, I'm going off track here. Back to back to the Rape of Nanking. Unlike other Chinese expeditions that were tended to be very um, disciplined, even if they were kind of cruelly military based, it became sort of an anarchy killing in the Rape of Nanking. And largely this was thought of just because the Japanese were getting fed up with um, 
Well, they both thought the Chinese as inferior, and they were just getting fed up of uh, kind of any sort of Japanese resistance. Basically, they just thought we're superior; we can just go in here and do this. Um, what what resistance are these stupid people going to provide? Those this is the Japanese mentality towards the Chinese. Okay, so that was the Red Banana King. Back to uh, MacArthur, basically ruled the the nation almost as like a co-emperor for i think it was like nine years or something um and essentially what happened is that a large part of the military machine that was built up in the united states uh at least in terms of the manufacturing was transported to japan now i don't mean like the physical transportation of plants but kind of the similar revving up of industry some of this had already been done, obviously, for Japan's own um, military ends uh, during the war. But the other thing that really happened is Japan emphasized peace in terms of country, but almost sort of like economic uh, hoarding uh, in terms of business, in that it would give homegrown Japanese tax-paying, or I guess not tax-paying, uh, businesses, ones that would were very ethnocentric to Japan, you know, like Yamaha, uh, Toyota, all the ones we know today, Honda, uh, Kawasaki, uh, all these big uh, Japanese corporations that give them favorable trade status or manufacturing status or tax status so that they could uh, essentially rev up in their own country. Uh, and I think MacArthur eventually got kicked out of his position in Japan, not really so much because of what he did in Japan, but because at the same time, you know, the uh, kind of conflict with Truman in the Korean War, um, and that also helped the Japanese economy in that the Korean War needed supplies, and Japan was right next door, and it could manufacture a lot of those supplies very quickly and get them over to Korea very easily. So that really helped Japan out a lot. Um, but the book kind of ends with the slow process of, if not withdraw, because the American troops are still in Japan even to today, and it remains controversial, um, the handover of power of choice of Americans being in Japan uh, to uh, the Japanese. Of course, politically, it would be suicide for the Japanese to actually say, we don't want you here, and they just have too much incentive from the United States to... Uh, keep troops there. Uh, the last thing is the Japanese um, self-defense force. There was a lot of argument about that in the Constitution, whether it should be or shouldn't be included. Um, but obviously is, because they have that. And some, some people are saying that Japan, a lot of Japan's uh, kind of modern debate about Constitution, uh, Constitution is too much focused on uh, the military self-defense force, which is written into the Constitution, and not enough on individual rights, or if people do have individual rights, sort of like the um, cultural undertone of the country. I don't know. I mean, you can't write that into a Constitution, but when you're focusing only on the Japanese self-defense force, you're not really as much focusing on um, kind of civil liberties within the country themselves. Okay, so this went way longer than I expected to. So, I think, let's see if we can get that. That says, Reinventing Japan by Ian. Oh, I didn't mention his name earlier. Ian Burma. Can you get that? Okay, well, this is, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be able to get that. But believe me, it's Ian Burma. Or no, Ian Bermuda. I-A-N-B-U-R-U-M-A. -A -A. It's a good author. It's a short book, but it's a good author. Well, anyway, uh, I'll see you later, guys. Bye.